Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, Danoon Institute of Biblical Research as well. And I really believe this is going to be a blessing to many of you. Uh, and of course, uh, after I did the video the other day when I was examining uh, from the book of Matthew, the Hebrew Matthew, in fact, as well, it uh, coincided with the Greek language too. That stirred up some controversy once again on the two witnesses. Uh, but, you know, I really began to understand why Jesus said, if you can receive it, uh, this is, speaking about John, he is the Elijah to come in the future, or the future to come, literally, is what it says in the Hebrew language. And the Greek also concurred with that. Uh, some people in there are saying, oh, that's, you're promoting reincarnation. No, I believe that's uh, the spirit of Elijah that is moving forward. Uh, but that's not the issue here. It, it still was amazing, even though clearly Yeshua himself, Jesus of Nazareth, testifies to the fact that Elijah would come before the great and dreadful day and that he would also restore all things according to another place in Matthew that's uh, even in our regular canon. People are still stuck on this other ideas, all these other ideas. I'm amazed. I am just totally amazed. But here we go again. I have come across another fascinating uh, nugget that was found in here, this time in uh, the 21st chapter of Matthew. And it's all about the Temple Mount, where the temple stood, and where the Roman fortress stood. And oddly enough, in the Hebrew Matthew, Jesus identifies the location of the Roman fortress. Uh, and then I've discovered amazing more insights that go with it. So let's sit back, let's take a look at it. I want to first share real quick, because I do get asked from time to time, especially in relation to Bob Cornuke's book and also Ken Klein's book. Uh, Ken Klein had actually contacted me before he ever published his work. Uh, he had sent me a DVD of the documentary he made before he made it public. Uh, and shared with me the evidence that he had discovered about the third temple being not where uh, it is believed to be on the Temple Mount today, but rather over where the city of David is. Uh, and ironically, I, I did go through it, and I appreciated that he sent it to me. I didn't know why, but he did. And, uh, but I did not see the connection, even though uh, he made a very good argument for it. Uh, and then, of course... Years later, Dr. Roddy Brown, here you'll see here on the video here, the evidence that the Temple Mount is Jewish. We did an actual video together about it because uh, Dr. Roddy Brown, he has two doctorate degrees and he really makes an incredible argument. He knows uh, Bob Cornuke, uh, he knows Ken Klein, and he also knows the man that they got the idea from. He talks about that and he refutes it remarkably. One of the key ideas for the temple being not on the Temple Mount, not just because they claim this was the Roman fortress, but because they said there was no water source. Now, of course, I have been there. I've seen the aqueducts. I have seen the large re uh, uh, reservoirs and the system that was built that took the water right to the Temple Mount. That's what we go to in this video. Let me just play a little clip here, though, of Roddy and what he is saying. Oh. <clears throat> okay, the issue of the temple. Why are you and I sitting here having this discussion today? It begins in uh, 1994. You have a Dr. Ernest Martin who writes a book and uh, I think it was the, the Lost Temples or the temples that the Jews forgot. The Jews forgot where their temples were. <clears throat> so why are we even discussing this? If you talk with theologians, archaeologists, historians, the experts, they're not even going to have a discussion with you. It's something that, that's a foregone conclusion. Um, they're just going to laugh. But what has happened since Dr. Martin's book, since Ken Klein, since Bob Cardinuke's book has come out, and since he has been endorsed by Chuck Missler, you have a few million Christians who are being led, deceived in the wrong direction. And how is that? Okay. You can watch the video for yourself to see that. Uh, I do want to kind of show you real quick some of the aqueducts there uh, that I actually share because me and uh, Roddy actually went and um, filmed a lot of this information together uh, while we were, of course, in Israel. Me and Roddy spend a lot of time together every time we're there anyway. 
Uh, but let's see, maybe here is one spot. Let me just see. That stone is too big to have been moved unless it fell from the top of the temple. That stone is the one that's blown on Shabbat and for all the high holy days for the Jewish people. Right? It's found at the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. Now the distance between there and the bottom of the city of David is approximately, I don't know, almost a mile, maybe more. And at a 60 degree angle coming up. I just don't think anybody's moved that stone that far in order to try to misguide us on where the temple was. Now you have to understand the stone he's talking about, and I'll back up for the picture so you can see this. Uh, it is inscribed. Let me just show you here. That stone is the one that's blown. <clears throat> it says there, it is Labayat. Uh, oh, it's hard for me to see the next word. Chata. I can't quite make out the rest of it because of the inscription there. But anyway, it's for the house. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it's the whole thing is, I'd have to go back and look to see. Let me just see if Roddy says it itself because I can't quite make out the letters. The uh, first three are easy to see. City, and they're not living on top of this temple mount. Okay, Steve, let's, uh, let's go do some, some basic archaeology history. You can pull this stuff up online and get even, even uh, I don't know, a 15-year-old, a 10-year-old doing a minimal amount of investigation can find this information out. Um, so, at the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount, when everybody comes to visit, there is a stone, a really large stone, and it's called the Trumpet Stone. That stone is too big to have been moved unless it fell from the top of the Temple. That stone is the one that's blown on Shabbat and for all the high holy days for the Jewish people. Right? It's found at the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. Now the distance between there and the bottom of the city of David is approximately, I don't know, almost a mile, maybe more. And at a 60 degree angle coming up. I just don't think anybody's moved that stone. Actually, they said on there in the inscription, it is to place of the trumpet, but it's Leviathan. It's to the house of the trumpet is actually what that would be. All right. So... After I was sharing with you the stone there that uh, Dr. Roddy Brown is showing in the video, I'd gotten a lot of questions uh, brought up on the Noon Institute about not one stone would be left upon another. So we've kind of added this one little section to the entire video for the sake of uh, people that watch it here on Israeli News Live uh, so that you guys can also, without not having everything together, we can look at this together. Uh, there's two things I'm going to share with you, and of course it's going to be from the book of Mark, chapter 13. Uh, this is the King James Version right here that I'm looking at, but I'm going to take you to the Hebrew Matthew as well on the same subject. Now, in Mark 13, it says here, And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Uh, I mean, hey, come on guys, think about it now. Thrown down. Now, I haven't even look, looked at this as the Greek. Maybe, all right, let's, let's, just do, let's do this. Let's run over here to the Greek. I, I've got to look at this. Thrown down is the Greek terminology. Okay, uh, to loosen down, that is to demolish, literally or figuratively, specifically, to halt for the night, destroy, dissolve, the, the guests lodge, come to naught, overthrow, throw down. All right, all these different uh, thoughts here. When I think of thrown down too, I'm also thinking about, well, they're thrown over the side of the Temple Mount to the ground below. All right, so that's just you know, a little conjecture there. Uh, on, on my part, but I just wanted to look at this in the Greek language as well, just to see. All right, now as we see this, right, there should not be, see, notice Jesus answering, saith unto them, Seest thou these great buildings? Nothing about the Temple Mount itself. The Temple Mount, you have to understand, is not a building, it's just a platform. It is a man made platform that the Temple sat on. All right. Now, some of you would probably be saying, oh, no, 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 the, the, all, the, the stones were completely removed, the mount was removed, everything. Well, he didn't say to remove the mount, he just said remove the buildings, okay? 
Okay, so we're gonna take, I've got some photographs here, and some of these I've actually were taken by me myself uh, as well, but because it says here that they would be thrown down, I wanted to show you some of the images here. Now this one I did not take, but I've seen this before here as well. These are on the outside of the southern wall of, uh, of the Temple Mount itself, and this is also believed to be stones that were that made up those buildings that were literally thrown down from the mount itself okay so like i said and, and there, there's many photos about this type of imagery here uh, but i think what's more important is when you go to the underground tour uh, on the western wall and i've been there several times before this is one of the photos that i took myself here uh, they talk about, you know, the walls that made up the mount itself when Herod actually had this uh, constructed. And, uh, but, but, the, but there's more information under there that just really uh, is exciting to me to be able to share with you. And this is one of the ones, because I could not find anywhere on the internet where uh, you could, someone had taken the picture under the glass floor of that underground tour. Now, I only found one of the ones I've taken. I've taken several in the past. Uh, this was not one of the best ones though, but this is one of the temple stones itself that was thrown down from the Temple Mount. And in some of the pictures that they have in the, under, the, under the glass of the floor, they show the tones, stones twisted, laying like this where they have been thrown down from the top and of course as years have gone by they built up around it but as they were doing the archaeological work rather than move them they just began to show how they were relating all twisted over that's important to remember all right and i'm going to share with you why in just a moment but i'll just uh, show you a couple of other things too another thing is this cistern right here and this cistern is connected to all the cisterns as I, I'll sh share with you uh, that go all the way to the Jaffa Gate and, and all the way outside the Jaffa Gate going up to the huge reservoirs that Israel has uh, and, and that goes way on up that brought all that water to the Temple Mount that created the water pressure to cause that to be able to come out like a modern uh, like a modern water tower, so to speak, but they were just using it with connected pipes and stuff. So that's why we know that they had a water source, which debunks uh, Bob Cranook and Ken Klein and the others' theories on this, that there was no water source. There was a water source. The evidence of the temple stones that they were overthrown over the walls, that is also clearly seen. Uh, and this, of course, this stone right here, which is what I showed you that uh, in the video that we did with... Uh, 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 Dr. Roddy Brown, uh, the stone here where the priest would go and blow uh, from the corner there of the wall uh, and saying that, you know, uh, do, doing, doing the different, uh, different things that the priest would actually do, making the announcement, blowing the trumpets there. All right, so these are things, we have the evidence of these things that really debunk a lot of that, but it's not that that's so important. It's the fact that so many people are stuck on that the Temple Mount itself had to be destroyed. When Mark clearly quotes Jesus uh, and he says, answering said, and seest thou these great buildings, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. All right. Now you could say destroyed, but it also literally means thrown down in the Greek. All right. Now I looked at this in the Hebrew Matthew uh, just to see out of curiosity and it's so much more rich, all right? Now, in the Hebrew Matthew, this comes up in chapter 24, all right? And it came to pass when Jesus went, and let me blow this up. I want you guys to really to be able to see this, okay? So I'm going to blow this up to 400, and for those that can read Hebrew, we'll do it the same there. And it came to pass when Jesus went out from the temple as he was going, his disciples drew near to show him the buildings of the temple. Nothing about the temple mount, the buildings of the temple. He said, and, and this is what Jesus says to them. He said, you see all these. Truly, I say to you that all will be destroyed and there will be there. Excuse me. And there will not be left there one stone upon another. All right. But now when you read it in Hebrew, what a rich understanding that we get here. All right. Now, 
Let me pull it up just a little bit. It's a little bit not exact. Oh, whoop, whoop, whoop. I shouldn't have done it that way. Let me see where I'm at. Yeah, I went too far down the whole page. Here we go, right here. All right. <clears throat> now, when he says here, I'm going to start right here at the bottom of the verse 1 there, okay? They, they show him, oh, come on. They show him the buildings. Now, I can't get the llama to highlight there. All right. La chara oto, all right, they show to him, and it's, and it's in the plural, all right, beninia, uh, ma, excuse me, hamakdosh, hamakdosh, all right, they showed him all of the holy buildings there, all right, the temple, literally this here is, is what we, how we would say, the, 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 the temple, the holy temple, all right, so they showed him, and it's in the plural, the, the, the structures there on the mount itself, those buildings, all right, but it's the way he answers, and I'm going to read all of this to you because it's just, this part here just really, well, I can't get it to highlight. Ah, let's, do, let's start here. It's just the way their program was set up. So he says here, Ve'yomer tara'u kol ha'ele amin. Okay, so he says, and he says, you see all these, ele, amin, amin, is truthfully, ani omer lechem, I say to you, she hakol yacharas velo yasha'a. Okay? He says, I say to you, all right, that, that all destruction and not, there will not be straight. Yashad is literally the word for straight. Won't even be one straight. Sham. Even al even, there will not be one straight stone that will be upon another. All right, this is literally what he says. There won't be there won't be a straight stone. They'll be twisted. All right. Now, again, though, it's only the buildings that are on the Temple Mount that he says this about, right? And then when he says that, when you talk about there not be one straight stone, that's why I wish, oh gosh, I wish I had that picture as well, because when you're going over the glass floor in that underground tour, there's one particular picture, and I've taken it, I just don't know where I got it at, that the stones are literally crossed over like that, right? The huge stones that made up the temple walls on the outside, which by the way, this little area here is where the boards would be there, and they say that these stones were actually from the time, uh, some of the stones that were being used were from the times of the first temple period. That's actually how they made up part of the walls there, was from the old stones. Now, this is the, this is what's just fascinating to me, you know? And then, of course, you see pictures like this right here. Again, they're not one straight. It's not that the stones disappear or anything, but it's only the building stones, right? It has nothing to do with the Temple Mount itself. Zero! It's just the holy buildings. And that is, is shown to us with the Hebrew Matthew as well as the book of Mark itself when he says, Seest thou these great buildings, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Ah, uh, come on, Steve, where is it at? Anyway, the whole point is I just wanted to show you some of the things there. And uh, I was hoping to be able to just quickly find the, here we go, right there. This is the pipes, the actual pipes that ran the water from huge aqueducts, uh, uh, reservoirs that are still in Israel to this day. These stones were placed together in order for that water to come to the Temple Mount. There's all sorts of, uh, here's one of the aqueducts there. there. There's no way the photograph can do that justice. It looks like probably when you guys are looking at this, just like some kind of big pool. Well, just going across that expanse there, or let me just give you an idea here. The length of it is close to, the, I would say, that of a football field in length and uh, wider than a football field across, much wider, actually. In fact, if you were to go around it, it's probably about a quarter of a mile circumference there. And that was uh, one of the reservoirs where the water was collected. And, of course, you go further up. Everything is all uphill. 
and the water works its way down all the way to Jaffa Gate. And when you go inside of Jaffa Gate, up underneath uh, where Roddy works at is one of the huge cisterns there where the water would gather up. Also up underneath the Jaffa Gate, another major cistern. And then all the piping uh, from this here all the way to the old city there, you got the piping works in there uh, that they have discovered. And of course, the issue is they had water. That's not why we're here though. All right, what we're here about is to discuss the biblical side of this. And of course, Roddy does do this as well. He shows you in the book of Psalms multiple times where David always places the temple north of the city. He calls it Mount Zion. Uh, this is one reason why Roddy always kind of gets after me when I say Mount Zion over there where the Pope went and held the, uh, the uh, upper room meeting there that Mount Zion is the north of the city. Well, technically, that's still north of the city of David as well, or you might say northwest corner, uh, technically. But, you know, Roddy's right. North of the city is Mount Zion. This is where uh, Mount Moriah is. This is where uh, Abraham brought Isaac. This is where the temple was built at. And, of course, the city of David is south of that. So, therefore, it could not be south of it as uh, Bob Cornuk and Ken Klein and all the rest of them are claiming. But, like I said, there's a lot of scriptural evidence to support that as well. But what I discovered uh, is just remarkable. Uh, and we're going to get into that here in just a second. Let me find the right place here. Uh, <clears throat> and, of, of course, the big issue is, is that they're saying the Temple Mount was uh, the, the Anton Antonia Fortress, the Roman Fortress. Uh, this map here that I'm showing you here in the background, uh, this puts the Antonio Fortress in behind the Temple Mount, but as uh, Bob Cornuk and Ken Klein put it, they say the Temple Mount was the actual fortress, and the temple itself was further to the south here where the uh, city of David is. And, of course, the idea is that, well, hi, hey, if this was really not the Temple Mount and it was down here, guys, you could build your temple now. I don't think so. Uh, that's Catholic Church property over here, and that may be one of the reasons why this is being pushed. But you go across the Kidron Valley, and we're over here on the Mount of Olives here, and just over the top ridge of the Mount of Olives is a place called Bethphage. Uh, and this is where Yeshua himself came up, and this is where he requests the, the, the donkey to ride into Jerusalem from. Uh, not actually in Bethphage, but at a place very close to that. And we're about to look at the biblical discovery for this. Now, if you look at the Greek, it speaks about a nearby village. Now, I will say one thing about the Greek language. The Greek language, when it speaks about that nearby village, that at least keeps us in the boundaries of the fact that the village is definitely not in Jerusalem. Otherwise, Yeshua would have said, go to Jerusalem and get me a donkey, bring it back, and I'm going to ride in on it. Right? Palm Sunday, as we often hear this as being stated. That wasn't the case. The Greek says a nearby village. All right? Now, this actually... Uh, uh, let me see where we're at here real quick here. I forget reason why I have this here. John chapter 19. Okay, yeah, I know why I have that there. Uh, I don't want to go that to that quite yet. Here we go. I didn't put it in the right order. That's where the problem is. All right. <clears throat> Again, I was reading in Shemtov's Hebrew gospel uh, or the Hebrew version of the book of Matthew, and I get to that very same issue there in chapter 21 when Yeshua is coming, to, uh, coming and he's getting ready to ride into Jerusalem uh, on uh, this particular day as the king riding on the, the, the mule, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. That's going to get interesting in a little bit too as well. Let me read to you though what it says here in the Hebrew Matthew, and then we're going to jump over to the Hebrew side of this and look at this. It says, They drew near to Jerusalem and came to Beth, uh, Bethpage on Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of his disciples, all right, so it does, he shows you right there. Let me just back up to the map again, to Bethpage. He's right there, not quite to the, to the hilltop of the Mount of Olives, but in behind that, all right, he comes there. He sends two of his disciples, and he said unto them, Go into the fortress which is opposite you, and immediately you will find a she-ass and her colt, uh, with her, unite them and bring them to me. 
if any if a man should say anything to you tell him the master has need of them and immediately he will let them go now I don't know about you but that caught my attention right there go into the fortress fortress right there let me blow that up real big I want to get that nice and big for everybody to be able to see that I want to make sure there's no question of what we're looking at all right he said unto them go into the fortress now that looks a little confusing which is opposite you and immediately you will find the she ass and her cult when I first read it because I read the English and not the Hebrew I thought wait a minute that doesn't make sense if it's opposite maybe that is over there on the Temple Mount area no no you have to understand the Hebrew language and they're just again translating it to the best of their ability all right so we're in verse 2 and let me get this to where get it right here in the right spot there here we go all right so he says to them to go all right okay Eliahem, which is way over here to them uh, to go el hamats excuse me ha mabatsar hamabatsar is a fortress it is not a village that's a military outpost and the only military outpost in all of Israel in that time was a Roman outpost all right but it's not <laughs> this is what gets interesting all right now he says he continues on okay I'll just highlight to the fortress Asharhu that which uh, it, it's Nachamecham Mebayad it is literally literally right next to your hand it's right it's right here beside you it's not opposite you it's right there beside you you're not going to cross the Kidron Valley right here on the Mount of Olives according to the Hebrew language of the Hebrew God of the Matthew's gospel which scholars all agree that he wrote in Hebrew the earliest church fathers for heaven's sake now, you can you can leave Nehemi Gordon out of it if you want to you can go back to the earliest church fathers said that Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew tongue yeah what do you know and Matthew writes and of course you know I agree with Nehemiah yeah, this these are copies Shem Tov has a copy of a copy of a copy not tell you how many times it's copied but even though there's differences just like in the Greek there's many differences in the Greek you know I mean how many thousands are uh, 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 that are different in between the earliest Greek Christian uh, new, uh, manuscript and the one that we have today uh, same thing goes with the Hebrew Isaiah scroll itself from Qumran versus the Isaiah scroll that we have in the Masoretic text 2,000 differences in it all right there's little scribal errors all, all the time that are done but nonetheless it's still it's still held to pretty faithfully down through time I believe it was pretty close to being faithful as well to the Hebrew Matthew as well and so he says Matthew is writing here you know go to the fortress that which is next to you you know and I actually put myself some notes I put in there going to the fortress which is right next to you is one of the ways that I put it or immediately actually the literal translation for those words there in Hebrew there is in your immediate presence it's right here the fortress there's only one fortress and it's a Roman fortress in their immediate presence now the funny thing is is dr. Roddy Brown also says that the Romans had their garrison or their fortress on the Mount of Olives which would make sense too because why the Mount of Olives is much higher in elevation that's why when you go up there on that lookout spot on the Mount of Olives what can you see you can see everything on the Temple Mount you're much higher above you can see what's going on if you got any kind of glass scope to see you know what's going on that's why they were there so here we have Yeshua doing this but there's another thing that I caught 
and this is what I got to share with you, is why would Yeshua send his disciples over to a Roman fortress to actually get the, the, the mule, the, 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 the donkey to ride on? Not a mule, but a donkey. Why would he do that? All right. Now there's several reasons behind all of this. One, of course, it fulfills Scripture, Zechariah 9, chapter 9, verse 9, but it doesn't fulfill chapter 9, verse 10. Another one of those things that I caught. So beautiful. I'm going to show I can't wait to share that one with you too, boy. It's exciting. All right. But let me share with you what I did see though, right? He says to him to go get him. He gets it from a Roman fortress. Why? That's why I had John open by. All right, so we come over here to John chapter 19, and, and uh, this just gets fascinating. Now, Pilate starts off speaking uh, to him. He says, Thou uh, speakest thou not unto me, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify you, and I have power to release you. Jesus answers him, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto you has the greater sin. Now it goes on, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Watch this now. Makes himself a king. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. All right. Then delivered him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Now, here's what's so fascinating about that, right? They said they have no king but Caesar. Right? Pilate says he brought him out. Behold your king. Now think about it. Yeshua comes up to the Mount of Olives, coming into town, knowing that this is going to be his last time. He stops at Bethpage. He tells his, uh, two of his apostles, go and get me the colt, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the, uh, a foal with her colt. At the fortress, right there, right in your, the very fortress that's in our presence now, which tells us that the Roman fortress was now on what? It was literally sitting on the Mount of Olives. Yeshua says, go get, go get it. Go get the colt from there. And if a man, if any man says something to you, why didn't he say any woman? But if any man says anything to you, why? Because it's men at the Roman fortress. Get the colt. Why does he get it from the, from the Roman fortress? Because Israel has already made Caesar their king. So he grabs, and this is only a conjecture, but he takes the colt from the Romans and he comes down to ride that, that foal, the, 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 the donkey, into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives as the king of Israel. And see, as they were already holding on to a Roman king, this is, we have no king but Caesar. All right, well, here he comes on the Roman donkey. And it just blows me away because he got it from the fortress. Not just the fact that it proves that the Temple Mount was the mount up there, what we see today, where the Dome of the Rock sits. That is where the temple actually stood. And the Roman fortress was on the Mount of Olives. You have the historical record laying right before your eyes that he sends them to the fortress, which was actually in their presence. Right, it's literally, it says it right at your hand. Not across the Kidron Valley, right there at your hand. He got the mule, he goes there, now he's coming as a king because he's also riding a Roman, Roman donkey. Now, here's what's interesting. I always wonder too, why a donkey? Why not a horse? Well, there's a beautiful website right here. It's called Got Questions. Uh, I can't say that the website's beautiful, but it's very interesting what they say here. Why would a king ride a donkey instead of a war horse? Well, that's the question. 
Answer, many have wondered why the king mentioned in Zechariah 9, 9 to 10 would ride a donkey into Jerusalem rather than a war horse. It seems an odd choice for royalty. Kings ride chargers, don't they? In the ancient Middle Eastern world, leaders rode horses if they rode to war, but donkeys if they came in peace. And he cites 1 Kings 1.33. Mentions Sol Solomon riding a donkey on the day he was recognized as the new king of Israel. Why a donkey? They were about to go to war. Because there was a war with, with David's sons on who should, who should actually take his place and be in his place as king. Remember Avshalom? Or actually, Avi Shalom, his son, uh, Absalom, as most people call him, Av Shalom. My father is peace. That's what it literally means, right? I actually pulled these out. I wanted to share with that to you, right? Now, 2 Samuel, because they, they cite this, 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 2. We'll be, start with verse 1. And when David was a little past the top, behold, Ziba, the servant of uh, Mephbosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled upon them 200 loaves of bread and a hundred clusters of raisins and a hundred summer fruits and a bottle of wine. Now this was for Absalom or Avi Shalom. And the king said unto Ziba, what meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, the asses are for the king's household to ride on and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine that such are faint in the wilderness may drink. See? Absalom was going to take and ride the donkey as a fulfillment that he was David's successor and he would do it showing that he comes in peace. But in 1 Kings, we find out that David commands as he's getting older. At that point there, David was not dead yet. His son was just usurping the authority. But as, he, as David's getting ready to die, there's a big Big, big uh, dispute going on over there. Who's going to be the king? So we're looking here, and this is in 1 Kings. Uh, and they, had, they marked it, so I pulled it all up from right here. 1 Kings, uh, verse 33. And the king said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon mine own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. It's a foreshadow of the coming of the Mashiach. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there, king over Israel, and blow you the, the, with the horn and say, Long live King Solomon. Right? Now we come to Zechariah 9, though. So the king does come in by the donkey, right? Now, according, here's what's fascinating. Let's go back to John, or not John, but, uh, wait a minute. Let me get real quick here. Uh, all right, Yeshua, when he comes in, all right, in the fifth verse, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king comes to, or wait a minute, uh, back up a, a minute, let's go to verse three. If a man should say anything to you, tell him the master has need of them, immediately he will let them go. All this was to fulfill the word of the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king comes to you just and victorious. He is humble and riding upon a she-ass and upon a colt of a foal of a she-ass. Right? Then they went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the she-ass and the colt, and Jesus rode it, while the others placed their garments and clothes upon them, and then they made the ascent. Then they make the ascent. They didn't come down from the Mount of Olives not one time until they went to that Roman fortress up on the Mount of Olives to get these donkeys. Right? And I mean, oh, it's beautiful, guys. I, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see the Word of God. But not only that, not only that, though, do you realize that when I was reading from this article over here, they said that was a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. It's not. It's only a fulfillment of verse 9. Only verse 9. Watch what we read there. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is triumphant and victorious, lowly, riding upon an ass, even upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I, all right, and that's what he said. And it says right there, that was fulfilled, nothing else. 
But they're saying verse 10 was fulfilled. No, it's not. Watch. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow, sh battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the nations. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is why the Jews believed that the Mashiach, when he comes, will bring peace. And it was never that was never to be filled then. The scripture clearly says it was verse 9 that was to be fulfilled. Why doesn't verse 10 get fulfilled at that time? It's because of Isaiah 61. He fulfills all of verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to opening of the eyes to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure. Half of verse 2 stops at the comma and leaves it off, closes the book and says, This day this scripture is fulfilled. When, when Matthew records him writing down on this cult, he only records, and it's in the King James Bible as well, only records verse 9 as being fulfilled, not verse 10. Why? Because the second half, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, has not been done yet. The mourning is Jerusalem mourning for who, what she did to her Messiah. All right? The vengeance of our God is to do what? Oh my gosh, look at this, guys. Look at this, Zechariah 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And, I mean, I realize you could probably take this and say, well, that means because the city is going to be destroyed. No, the chariot and the horse, the horse and his horse rider that come against Jerusalem to destroy it, he's going to cut them off. And how does he do it? Moses said how you would do it right here. He cast the horse and his rider into the sea. Now notice this. That's Moses that does it. And Moses, Asherah, I will sing. Not, he's, he's singing right then and there. He was singing right then, but he says, I will sing. That God will get his victory over the horse and his rider. The horse and the rider of Revelation. That last horse rider. Right? Now, I'm going to show you something. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. Zechariah 9, go back to verse 10. What does he say here? See, right here. Rekev, Vesus, I will cut off the chariot, that's the Rekev, in the Hebrew Moses says Rekevo, which is his chariot, or his rider, because Rekev is used for rider and for chariot both, alright, it's singular, and in both cases, even in Zechariah, the Mashiach cuts off the horse and his rider, the chariot, and the horse, Oh my gosh, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It dovetails so well. It's just like when I was reading to you guys the other day, and, and let me find it again. Uh, and I was sharing to you from the book of Matthew right here, where I, I, I was just blown away. You know, that Yeshua himself, and I think it's in chapter 11, Yeshua himself says about John, Okay, yeah, here it is. Chapter 11, verse 14. I'll pull it up back over, over here for you. Because you got to see this, guys. You know, and people just didn't get it. You know, you don't, a lot of people just overlook these things. They don't realize what's being said. Okay? That's why Yeshua says, if you can receive it. You know, friends, that's why I say, you know, be patient with me. Listen to what I'm telling you because I want to help you. It's not to be arrogant or prideful or anything like that. It's just he's shown me these things. He's shown me for years. I mean, for heaven's sake, back many years ago, and it's been 30 years ago nearly, he speaks to me audibly and tells me to read Isaiah 61. I never understood why. He shows me in a vision them over there putting the temple on the, on, on the temple mount. And he says, there's a man sitting here drinking on God's holy mountain and you're to remove him. I'm nobody to remove nobody. But I realized that if I would testify to the truth of what he showed me, that's how God removes them. 
It's just tell the truth. God will do the rest. It's not that i got to go do something spectacular. No, I have nothing to do with that. But if I would testify, God would take care of that problem. And I told it to the, to the very rabbis and the young, young uh, rabbinical Jews that were there on Mount Zion. And then they began to stand up against the church for having those communion services there in, in the uh, upper room and in David's tomb and put a stop to it. Mainly because of David's tomb. They want to do it in the upper room. I don't have a problem with that. But the scripture says they would do it. Obadiah's prophecy. Clearly, Obadiah, right? Now, getting back to this, though. It says here, plain as day, verse 14. If you wish to receive it, Jesus talking about, it, about John. Now, John's in prison. He's not coming out. He's about to die. He's going to be beheaded. He, so he says, if you wish to receive it, he is Elijah who is going to come. And in Hebrew, and I'll blow this up so you can see this. I want you to really get this. Hebrew is even more powerful than in English. All right? It says right here, Hu Eliyahu Ha'atid Lebo. All right? Who, he, Elijah, he's Elijah. We don't have the word is in Hebrew, so you apply it in English when you do it. He is Elijah. Who? John. John was Elijah. Ha'atid. Okay? The definite article hey in front of Atid. And Atid is the word for future in Hebrew. He is Elijah, the future to come. I mean, it's so powerful in the Hebrew language. He is the Elijah that is coming to the future. This is why also, I think, what is it, uh, chapter 14, I believe, and, and, and when he, they come off the Mount Transfiguration and, and uh, Jesus, uh, you know, they ask him the question, I thought the scribes or the sages said that uh, Elijah was to come first. And Yeshua says, truly, John, keep in mind, John is dead. Truly, Elijah shall first come and restore all things. Perfectly in line with what it really says. And then when I looked at it in the Greek, the Greek also put it in the future. But translators translate it based on what they thought the theology was. And again, Malachi in his prophecy is just like in Isaiah 61, just like in Zechariah 9. Half the prophecy is fulfilled, the other half is not fulfilled. Why? It's for the second coming. And so for my Jewish brethren that are listening to this video tonight, let me explain to you clearly. You were looking, you know that this is the Messiah that comes on this, this is the King of Israel, but you said he's supposed to bring peace, right? You know that, right? And so the thing is, because of verse 10, nowhere did they ever say that Yeshua fulfilled verse 10. The two witnesses come, just like when, when God said to Moses, I have come down, I am going to deliver my people. And then he says to Moses, and I'm sending you. He sends his two witnesses to forerun his miraculous work that he's about to do. And they will cut, he says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. How? With his two witnesses. Just like he said before, God gives personal pronoun every time back then too. Well, who did it? He sent Moses and Aaron to do the job. It's unbelievable. But it's exciting. And as I was saying to you, was so exciting to me as well though. Going back to, to this one last time, uh, as we close in this broadcast tonight, let me find it again, he, Gordon's Hebrew Matthew, to see that the mount, that the mount, uh, excuse me, the, the, that the temple mount really is the temple mount. And that uh, when we, when we uh, and I forget where I was at now, so, uh, I, I can't find it now because I, I didn't mark my page here. I just quickly turned. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I got it right here. Uh, chapter 21. Uh, and, and, and sister, there's a precious sister that's a good friend of ours. Uh, she had said, Steve, please do uh, chapter 24. I'll get to chapter 24. Oh, by the way, speaking of chapter 24, let me just turn to that real quick. Well, I, I said I'd do this one. Let me do this real quick. There's one other thing you need to know as well, and I think we should do it while we're on this video. All right, getting down to verse 21, we're going to go to verse 20 or chapter 21. Uh, we're going to come to verse 2. Here it is again. Uh, and he said unto them, Go into the fortress. Now they put translate it which is opposite you. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. It says, Go to the fortress which is immediately present. 
And literally in Hebrew, which is immediately present from your hand. In other words, it's right here, a fortress on the Mount of Olives. What an amazing, amazing insight. Now, let me see if I can remember to do this. I haven't, this was a, a sister Nancy, precious sister met me there in um, Kansas, walked up, gave me this Hebrew Matthew. I was so badly wanting one and uh, my wife ordered it, but they sent me the one that only had English. And I was like, no, 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 I got to have it in the Hebrew. I want to be able to read what Hebrew says, not what they have there. Uh, but also there is another part here. And it was actually in the 24th chapter. And let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. Let me just do it on the screen because you guys won't see it there. And I don't have it marked anyway in the book yet. Um, there's a lot of things written in Matthew 24 in Hebrew. And uh, my copy that I have in Europe, I, I actually had... That's where I first began to translate this myself. Because I can see the little mistakes they were making. Um, uh, okay, all these are the beginnings of suffering. Then they will bind you over for the tribulation and will kill you, and you will become a reproach to all nations for my namesake. All right? Now, then many will be perturbed and deal treacherously with each other and, and be in, enraged among themselves. False prophets will arise and lead many astray. It's just what they're doing today, right? And, uh, and when the wicked, wickedness multi, multi, multiplies, the love of many will grow faint. Whoever waits until the end will be saved. And this gospel, here it is, verse 14, that is, Evangeli, will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all nations, then the end will come. All right? Now, I don't know what it was about this, but when I read that that day, I knew then that was the two witnesses. When he says, when this gospel, that because remember what does he say about John? He says about John, excuse me, Elijah, the Elijah that is to come, he said he will restore all things. So as he's saying here, when this gospel, that is evangeli, is preached in all the earth, for a witness concerning me to all nations, and then the end will come. When Elijah with Moses come and restore the word of God back, that's when the end comes. We are nearing that time, friends. I trust it's a blessing to you. If you like someone to tell you the truth, you know, if I make a mistake, I gladly correct it. But if you like someone to tell you the truth, stand with us, won't you? We appreciate your love and your stand and your support of this ministry. And I'll quit talking about it the rest of the week coming up, but I'm just asking you because this time of year people get distracted and stuff with uh, the seasons, the way people uh, uh, do the, in each of their own private ways. But uh, uh, for us, we're still working. We still are there trying to bring the gospel of Yeshua to you and to cause people to recognize who the Messiah is. For you, my Jewish brothers that are listening, and even if you're a Gentile or whatever you may be, if something has stirred your heart today and you believe that you need to give your life to Christ, I pray that you'll do so. I pray you'll do so. I'm gonna, I want to pray for you just, just briefly here. And then you go, you repent of your sins. You want to write me? You write me, stephenbenoon at gmail.com. Just with, put something that is important, prayer. I, I, I give my heart to Yeshua. I believe that He is the Messiah now. Send me a private letter about that. I'll be glad to pray with you, work with you, and help you to find a way to be baptized as well. It's important that you do these things. All right, let's just do that. The other things can wait. We'll talk about this now. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are listening tonight. I'll never forget, Father, is I felt on my heart to pray for the people one night. I got a letter from a brother in India who had been a Hindu for 30, I think it was 34 years, if I remember right, Father, that wrote me. And he said he was so moved in his heart after hearing the message that you had given me to speak to the people, that he give his life to Yeshua HaMashiach, to the Lord Jesus Christ.
I pray, Father God, that something was said tonight that will cause the same stirring within your people, that will cause them also, for the Jewish people all over the world that are hearing, may their ears come open and their eyes have sight to recognize. For as you said, all that have ears that can hear, they will come to me. None of them will be left out. I pray for them tonight, Father, in the name above every name, the very name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Blessings to you all. Thank you for watching and hope to get to talk to you again soon tomorrow about more fascinating insights that we see. Shalom, shalom.